interns and an advisor to uh, half a dozen others. Um, sometimes when I go particularly to speak to practitioners, and I'll probably tell this story tonight, so some of you are going to hear it again, um, and I'll run through it really quickly uh, for you all. Um, in the uh, fall of uh, 1982, while um, my partner was in Aspen on business, I got appendicitis and uh, was in the hospital for four days. Uh, during that time, I had a set of construction documents that had to be completed and filed for permit, a review of a uh, program with a client, and a set of uh, presentation drawings that had to be completed uh, preparatory to a meeting the following week. Uh, my three IDP interns in the office, working probably about 80 hours a week, uh, each of them, managed to finish up all of the work that we had scheduled in the office uh, for that week uh, with a minimum of direction, uh, with a minimum of uh, outside help. They organized it entirely on their own, and I'm convinced that the only reason they were able uh, to do this and to complete all of these tasks uh, so satisfactorily was because they had been IDP interns, had been exposed to the full range of our practice, and not only were knowledgeable of the construction documents themselves, but of other office practices uh, that we had. And uh, because of this uh, very useful experience uh, with IDP, I went from being uh, someone who, like Henry Meyer, didn't think that IDP was a very good idea several years ago, to someone who's convinced of its value to the profession. I'm going to start you all off at the beginning of IDP, because I understand that while some of you may know something about it, a number of you uh, uh, have no idea uh, at all what IDP is about. And I'd like to say uh, a couple of words uh, in starting. Um, the situation with IDP in, uh, in Indiana is that it's going to be considered after a pilot period uh, here in the state uh, by the State Registration Board. We hope that the board won't consider adopting IDP as a mandatory requirement for admission to the uh, architecture registration exam. What we hope is that the board will make IDP available to graduates of uh, Ball State University and other schools uh, of architecture as an alternative method of preparing for admission to the examination. That they will consider it equivalent to the traditional preparation requirements that the state registration board now applies, but that they will not adopt it as mandatory. It will be essentially something that uh, will qualify you to take the exam, uh, but not something that uh, you will be required uh, to proceed through. Uh, let me start then about uh, IDP. IDP is intended to take care of the wide gap between architectural school and architectural practice. This training interval, which is essentially an internship to the profession or an apprenticeship, can be a difficult time for intern architects, yet it's vitally important. Internship is a time to develop professional judgment, to absorb the flavor of the profession, to apply formal education, to work experience, and to refine individual career objectives. Perhaps most importantly, internship is a time to develop a good habit of lifelong learning. Every day I get letters from students and young graduates asking me what they need to know in order to become a registered architect. A lot of them want me to send them AIA requirements for registration. Many of them have gotten all the way through architecture school and still don't know that they have to apply to their state registration board to be admitted to the exam. They don't know that requirements for admission to the exam differ state by state, that the training period requirement is different in most of the states. They don't know how they'll know when they're ready to take the exam. How does their experience, their work experience in an office qualify them for admission to the exam? They don't know where they can find answers to their questions. They're not easy questions to answer. And very often, you folks are left on your own to find them out sort of hit and miss. Very often, our own profession has been of little help. It's amazing how once we get into practice, we forget the arduous journey that we went through to get there. The profession is now responding to the needs and interests of intern architects. It has developed a unique program to provide entering members of the profession with an opportunity for exposure and training in the broad areas of architectural practice. The Intern Architect Development Program, IDP, is a bold demonstration of the If 
not, not if it was adopted under the circumstances that I outlined. In other words, if you were already in the pipeline, you have a right to finish. Uh, but uh, I, I'd like to clear up what seems to be maybe a little bit of a, of a misconception on IDP. IDP requires 700 value units to, uh, to complete it. The, the great bulk of those are in work that most of you uh, will probably be doing when you graduate in construction documents. Uh, there is a great deal of flexibility in the requirements. Uh, very few of you will find that you're unable to meet the minimums in the several different areas, the 14 different uh, areas. Uh, right now, the requirements of the state of uh, Indiana and, and most other states are that, uh, that a form be filled out when you've completed your training period that's submitted to the state registration board. Those that you have worked for certify that you spent 25% of your time doing this and 40% doing something else. And then the straight state registration board decides whether that is adequate. I mean, have you been prepared to be an architect? Do you know all of the range of experience that an architect is required to have to practice? Um, and that determination is made to a certain extent without express standards. Uh, IDP simply substitutes known standards, so many hours in this, so many hours in this, and I don't think most of you will find that they're unreasonable standards. And if you bear in mind that the overall idea of IDP is to prepare you generally for professional practice. After all, an architect, when he takes his exam, should be competent in the whole range of architectural practice. Whether or not you go on to work for Eli Lilly or to specialize, become an educator, when you take your exam, you should be competent in the whole range of subjects that an architect needs to know in order to go into practice by himself as a sole proprietor. Uh, that's the idea of IDP, is to tell you, this will do it. Start here, get so many of this, so many of this, so many of this. Then you'll know everything from office practice to construction documents to marketing to the various ways that contracts are uh, entered into. And you'll be competent to practice. That's pretty much all it is. It's a formalization of a process that already exists and a supplying of standards. I've talked too long, I'm sorry. Yeah, about two uh, years, eight months? It's possible to finish it in less than, than three years. If you work when you start, when you finished your third year in school, you can finish it in less than, three, than two years. We've had one intern that finished it in about a year and eight months, but he was extraordinary. Uh, most people take almost the same as the durational requirement in most states. Which How was that that he finished it in a year and eight months? Over no. time, supplementary education, and work during school. A good deal of overtime. Now, could he still, in some states, then take the state boards earlier because he had finished the yeah. In those states that adopt IDP as being equivalent to their state registration requirements, you can be admitted to the exam. And that's what we hope Indiana will do. Say, so you can go the old way, spend three years working in an office, or you can go IDP, and when you finish, take the exam. The value unit is equal to about an hour. So about eight hours. Eight hours. Eight hours. Eight hours. Yeah. Eight hours. Yes, sir. Would you stand, please? Wait, wait. We can't hear. IDP. If you don't get academic credit for it and you're past your third year, you can get value units for it. You can't gain credit if you're doing a co-op program. Internship 
has been counted in the past. Yeah. No, that, it, in Indiana, we have a we have an alumnus who is having a problem in Texas getting Texas to recognize his internship. We're writing letters right now to try to get half of his internship credited in Texas. As a, as a matter of fact, our curriculum committee in architecture is supposed to be working on the problem and, is, and will somehow change either not give credit and charge a fee or at least make some arrangement with the NCAR, NCARB because uh, Cincinnati has no problem counting their experience after the third year, and surely the NCARB can do something uh, with Ball State's uh, problem. So I expect that as soon as that correspondence takes place between the department and the NCARB for that problem to be solved. At the moment, though, it is hanging, and we didn't even know there was a problem until uh, until the man came here from IDP last year, Ron, when, Rob, when he came here. So there is uh, some solution is supposed to be in the work. I'm sorry, I can't hear. I hope so. May I, may I? Yes, you may speak to that. I want to go back a little bit to the uh, question about uh, reciprocity. Uh, an NCARB certificate uh, does not necessarily ensure that you will be accepted for reciprocity. Uh, all that means is that, that uh, NCARB does recognize your experience uh, by their standards. However, if, if you come from another state to Indiana, the Indiana Registration Board will take your records and compare your method of uh, initial, your first registration in whatever state you're in, and compare that process to the process that was in effect in Indiana at that time. And if you meet the requirements of Indiana, uh, say in 1932 or 1964, and you were registered in if your first registration was in another state in that same year and you had the same process, they will accept you. If, if they feel that the process in that other state was deficient to our requirements at that point in time, they will not. They will ask you to do something to make it up. Uh, to me, there, there's a little misconception on this NCARB certificate. It's a certificate, not a registration, when you get an NCARB certificate. Yes. Is IDP mandatory in Indiana yet? And if it's not, will it be? And how soon? Can Ray? Can Ray Kirkhoff? Can Lou? Ray yesterday. Ray, you probably can. Well, I don't know what the registration board is is going to do because what you're asking is how will they vote in the future? Right now, they have held off making it mandatory because the Indiana Society of Architects has agreed to, to have 12 interns run through the program so they can be monitored by the chapters. And this monitoring will, will determine uh, just exactly how much work is involved, whether the, the intern really is uh, improved by having gone through it, and also whether or not we're improving our, our uh, uh, visibility to, to the public. So, whether it'll actually be mandatory, uh, I guess based on what Lois is saying earlier, AIA does not want it to be mandatory. They're in fact going back to states that are where it's now mandatory and trying to get them to change their laws. The intent is to have it voluntary. But uh, I would hope that after this trial program that it would become a voluntary program for the, for the state of Indiana. Uh, again, Ray, I, I think we ought to make it clear to the students that even though we're on a trial program sponsored by the Indiana Society of Architects, any student who's passed his third year may apply for an IDP record 
and begin his IDP record immediately. That's right. Now, uh, the only problem he might have would be in an office that would refuse to give him credit or refuse to sign the IDP forms. I doubt that there would be any office that would refuse to do that. So, uh, uh, being a person who's in favor of the IDP, I'm supposed to be impartial here, but being in favor of it, I have to say that I would encourage everyone to start an IDP record uh, just immediately. Yeah, I might mention that uh, monitoring 12 doesn't mean that there can be there couldn't be a hundred going through. Right now, without it being even uh, promoted by the registration board or the uh, Indiana Society of Architects, there are three three interns uh, compiling their NCARB uh, certificate. Isn't that right? In the state of Indiana. Yes, there's a question here. If I uh, ever graduate from here and go to a state that doesn't have uh, IDP, and I want to go through it and program, can I or do I have to go to a state that already has IDP enacted? What I'm saying is if it's not mandatory, if they don't have that program in the state, what do I do then? I think Chris wants to answer that. Well, each state has its own requirement, and NCARB is trying to put some basic guidelines across the United States for people to go through their internship. That's the bottom line of it. When you go to another state, you can enroll in the intern development program. You don't have to enroll if you don't want to. You can um, pick up the forms anywhere and follow it yourself. It's up to you as the intern to make your internship as broad as you can. Um, once you get out of school, there's nobody going to be holding your hand anymore. You know, and it's a big shock to a lot of people. And Henry was saying things like, he was, I was saying, that he was upset that, and practitioners are saying that, that students aren't ready to be architects and aren't, aren't well trained when they come out of school. Well, school's the time where you should develop your thought process. There's no way that in your four or five or six years of school that you can learn everything, okay? You get out into the field, and I think it is part of a responsibility of a registered excuse me, a registered architect to take some time and bring you up and improve you to become a, a better professional. You know, but the basic question is, yes, you can do it on your own. It's up to you to continue your education for the rest of your life. It doesn't stop as soon as you're finished with school. You know, it'll go forever. Yes, question here. <clears throat> My question is, you get just as much as, uh, credit for working for a large corporation like uh, IBM facilities or working in the uh, Department of Metropolitan Development in Indianapolis, somebody like that, you can get them on the architecture project. It's the same. One unit is an eight-hour day. But there's a minimum that you have to acquire in traditional practice. Right. So the answer in, in many respects is no. You'll find that the, the requirements, I'm not familiar with the requirements of the Indiana State Board in, uh, for what I would call, say, the non-traditional uh, office setting. Uh, but um, in general, uh, it is not possible to complete IDP without spending approximately a year uh, in the office of a registered architect. Um, this goes along with our feeling that it's necessary to be a generalist. You have to have broad exposure. You have to know everything about the practice of architecture. You don't learn that working for a large corporation as a facilities designer. And you've got to get that. It's essential. May, may I add to, to that answer in that if you worked, for instance, in Indianapolis for the Department of Metropolitan Development, you would be getting some experience there that you would not be getting in Henry Meyer's office. There are some elements then that you should make up with internship in a different place or with a, a supplementary education, guide education 
or by taking some, con sub some supplementary education courses that will be offered or that uh, are offered in many places at this point in time. So in a, in a way, it makes it uh, more desirable to work for a, for a business or for a department of metropolitan development in that there is a route to go to get that further uh, uh, education. In the same way, if you're working in a small office or a large office that's dealing with uh, strict architectural process, that there are some things that you may still need to get through a supplementary education uh, uh, source so that, so that you really look at that three years as a program, as a whole educational program, and it reinforces the idea of the internship as still being a continuing learning process preparing for licensing. Yes, sir. Uh, I think it was and we still meet the requirements by just working three years in our office or not the classes. Need to repeat the question. The question is, if IDP is required, can you satisfy the requirements in a normal office in three years? or would you be required to take some supplementary education? You should, you should be able to finish in somewhat less than three years just working ordinary eight-hour days in a, a practice that offers you a fairly comprehensive um, uh, approach. Uh, if you can get exposure to you know, programming, client contact, uh, to office practice uh, procedures, uh, as well as to construction documents. Yes, you shouldn't have any trouble finishing IDP in three years without supplementary education. Uh, Henry. Uh, I want to go back to the question about uh, working for a large uh, facilities department. If, if you do have an opportunity to uh, get that kind of a position when you graduate, uh, the thing you need to do is, is to talk to their personnel people to be sure that they are, will be committed to help you as much as they can uh, with your IDP program. In other words, uh, many of the 14 items you can get working for a facilities planning group and then through the use of SUPED guides, uh, which uh, is supplementary education guides, and going through that process, you should be able to complete your IDP program. Now, it takes a lot of extra work, outside work, and I think you would want to also uh, verify that they would be committed to having a, a sponsor and a, an advisor for you who would help you through this uh, other parts of the 14 points that you cannot get in your normal work day. For your, for your interest, we have five alumni working with Humana in Louisville, we have uh, at least one alumnus working with Eli Lilly in Indianapolis. We have one alumnus at least working with the Department of Metropolitan Development in Indianapolis. We have uh, at least one alumnus working with Ball Corporation in their architectural branch here in Muncie. So we do have alumni in, uh, in large, large uh, uh, corporate or metropolitan situations. Yes, sir. Let me repeat the question. He's, uh, he's concerned about the cost of uh, maintaining an IDP record. If you elect to go through IDP entirely on your own, fill out the forms, have your sponsor and your advisor sign off on them, and send them into your state registration board at the end of your internship period, the only cost would be the cost of Xeroxing the form, which is in the back of this book. If you wish to have the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards maintain your record for you, 
you mail it into them every month and they keep a record and when you're finished with the IDP training period they take your whole record and they send it off to Indiana and they say this young man has completed IDP and that costs you thirty dollars for the initial application and it costs you twenty dollars each year that, to maintain the application and it costs you forty five dollars to have that application transferred from NCARB to the state when you're ready to take your examination. But you don't have to do it that way. That's simply a convenience. Yes, sir. If you did it on your own that way, would it take any longer to process it since you're sending it all in at once, uh, as opposed to since you're sending it in monthly and they keep a tabulation of you know, the undergraduate tabulation? Would it take longer to process and get back since you send it all in at once? When you're finished, you're not sent, if you do it on your own, not through NCARB, you're sending it directly to the state board. You're not sending it to NCARB for them to send it to the state board. You as an intern have to document your work experience somehow to turn into your state board to take the exam. And they have to look at it and say, yes, you've done the three years that we require. Can I pose a question? Is it, is it a convenience to be on the IDP program and to have all your records done as you go rather than trying to gather all your recommendations and records together after three years? I think that's probably the biggest problem that, that interns have once they, it, it gets down to a few months before the exam and they realize, uh-oh, I have to you know, compile all this work. And it takes a long time to go back. And if you, if you transferred through a few firms to get all those people to help you document your experience, it takes a long time. But I've enrolled, and I'm, I'm doing it this year. And if you start off, as soon as you start working, and just enroll. And at the end of each work week, just jot down you know, what you've done and have your employer look at it. And, or at the end of every month, just do it as a process. I mean, I don't. I don't how many of you could, could step out and start working and say, I know exactly what I need to know to take the exam? I mean, they're, they're sitting it down in front of you in an easy little chart to fill out of 14 areas, and you just fill it out. They're developing the process for you. Otherwise, you'd have to do it all on your own and try to assume what you need to learn. There was, a, I'd like to pose a question to the whole panel. Maybe we can get each one of you to speak to this. That was, uh, it was brought up uh, by what uh, Henry Meyer had to say. He says that, that the program is another restraint to getting registered. Or he asked the question, is it another restraint? I would ask the question, is it another restraint or is it another opportunity? And I'd like to have some people speak to that and maybe Ron uh, Fisher would like to, to start. I believe it would be made mandatory that there are a lot of questions and there are a lot of restraints that could be built into that. But given the fact that to date that it is not mandatory, that we're running a test program here in Indiana, leading to perhaps a recommendation that it be voluntary, I feel that that leaves the student or the intern with the opportunity to see which way he wants to go to meet his requirements to take the exam and and that way he can look at it and decide where the restraints are or not and where his opportunities are. I think what Christine said is probably the the best feature of the program. It gives you a road map to prepare yourself. It gives you some criteria against which to measure your training experience, you can see at a glance after you've been a few months into the program that you need to gather more experience in office practice, in programming, in client contact. It gives you a tool to go to your employer and say, uh, I'm going to be taking my exams next year and look, I'm still short you know, 50 value units in, uh, in client contact. Isn't there some way we can work this out? Um, you, you know immediately what you need to know in order to successfully attack the exam and in order to prepare yourself uh, for practice. That's perhaps its major advantage. And I think that uh, um, it's not uh, at all a restraint 
uh, I would certainly urge the uh, Indiana State Board not to adopt it as a mandatory uh, requirement for sitting the exam, but to offer interns the choice uh, between completing IDP, possibly in less than the three years that, are, that is the current durational requirement, or going through the usual um, uh, requirement of, of sitting, uh, of working for three years uh, for a registered architect. I think this gives um, the greatest um, impetus to the program uh, without affecting um, the future of uh, young people who may not wish to participate in the program. I think that the IDP program uh, is exactly what San Francisco chapters came up with and called it bridging the gap. I think that when you go through school, you are, are learning the theoretical side, learning to think. And I think when you get out of college, you're going to suddenly discover that nobody is, is watching over you, like was mentioned here earlier. And until you become registered, it, you're sort of spinning. And so it does get put it on, in a structured way, a way for you to get the experience to become registered. But I think in addition to that, we have an image problem with the public. And I think it's a great chance to show the public that uh, we, we do have a structured method for becoming uh, more experienced. And I think that it will improve the image of architects across the nation. I hope that we'll be able to prove that the IDP program has, has helped interns become better architects to make you think in broader terms and make you more aware of everything. Right now, our, pro our profession compared to lawyers and doctors has an incredibly low passing rate on exams, an incredibly low compensation for work we do and a much lower pay scale. And there's got to be some ways for us to start being concerned about the standard of our profession and how the public looks at us as professionals. I, I think the IDP program will help us do that. I look upon this IDP program, particularly as it's already been implemented by the, the states where it currently is online, as very decidedly a restraint uh, on becoming a, a professional licensed architect. Uh, right now it's mandatory in those states and if you don't want to play the game, that's the only game in town, so you're out of luck. Uh, as it's, I didn't realize before today that there was at least the possibility of it not being a mandatory program. That's probably the best news I've had all day. Uh, but philosophically I'm just utterly opposed to the whole imposition of a, another layer of bureaucracy uh, between the stage you're at right now and ultimately becoming licensed as an architect. Uh, Lois even said that it's not a fundamentally different type of uh, uh, experience than one is going through now and so I really don't see the advantage of formalizing it into this rather bureaucratic system of 14 uh, facets of the, uh, the experience one would have as an architect. Uh, I just don't think that it's, it's really necessary. I can see how it might be an aid to the student who, or to the emerging professional who has graduated from a school and who's on his way or her way to becoming a licensed architect. But it seems to me also that there's something incumbent upon you after you've graduated, and that's to take matters into your own, on your own, and not rely on what is necessary to someone else. And it seems to me that you at a and, and figure out where you stand. It seems to me that uh, for individuals to take that upon themselves, and I think that uh, as such, it's really not terribly necessary. Can I ask you a question? Are you registered? No. No? Uh, necessary. Can I ask you a question? Are you registered? No. No? Uh, um, no. <laughs> Are you registered? No. Um, no. <laughs> um, are you planning on becoming? Are you planning on becoming registered? Certainly. How did you find out what you need to turn into your state board, or how do you know about that? You called up the state board and asked them what I need to know. Mm -hmm. And talk to friends uh, who are going through the experience okay. in Minnesota and, and so on. Okay. And uh, okay, I guess I just and. Uh, Okay, I guess I just, 
you you meet a lot of people that walk into a firm and and get stuck in doing bathroom details for three years or and not being really aware that they need to know well, all these different care well, of that. Well, if you don't, don't like have to. Why not? Why not? You know, it's like why stick around doing bathroom details? But well, if you don't, don't like have to sneak around. Details, you know, it's like why stick around doing bathroom details? But. I mean, there's so much you need to know as an architect. I mean, you need to be a truly renaissance person. Mm -hmm. And why have to, you know, just keep beating your head against the wall to find out, oh, I have to know this, and I have to know this, and this, and this, and this. Why do you have, I mean, why do you have to push a piece of paper in front of someone saying, look, I have to do this. You know, I, I've been doing bathroom details for, for years now, and I'm tired of it. So this little piece of paper says I get to do something else. Why can't you just voice your own opinion and say, I'm not going to do it anymore? You should be able to. But there's a lot of people that, that aren't aware of, of that. I mean, I, I, I couldn't say that 90% that of kids walking out of schools would say, I need to know construction, construction documents, and I need to know this, and I need to know this, and I need to know more of this, and I need to get with clients, and I need to do this. I would just say that the whole thing helps, helps the weak person. That's what Only that well. people that don't have the initiative to find out what it takes to registered architect, uh, they might need this type of thing. Well, th the that may be. The comment is that uh, from the front here was that, that, the, uh, uh, that it is a, a help to the weaker person. Uh, uh, could, could we have a comment over here or a question? Oh, would you stand? If it does become voluntary, then there isn't actually anything that says you're going to get that experience, correct? If it's, all, if it's a voluntary program, and I work for Mr. Meyer, then he doesn't necessarily have to give me all the experiences that are laid out by the IDP. Right? Oh, I bet he wouldn't refuse, though. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me answer this question first here. Um, the problem that IDP is trying to address is that when you come out of school you have no way of really understanding what it's going to take to be registered. You can write your board, you can say what do I need and they'll say three years work under a registered architect, three character references, over 18, etc, etc, an accredited degree, first professional degree. But you don't know how much of your time you should be spending where and no matter how much you talk to your peers you're not going to find that out. You can spend some time with AIA members and they'll tell you one thing and some will tell you some something else because a lot of them don't know either. That's the reason for IDP. It's a training standard. It says, and it's based on a study of what architectural professionals do for a living and what they need to know in order to do a good job at it. It says so much of your time should be spent here and so much somewhere else. And so if you prepare in this way, you'll have a comprehensive training period. The thing I like to test uh, the registration when, when you talk to people you might ask them, how much should I study on the structures part? Because I'm not really sure if I want to study the, you know, the whole thing that I had. And they might say, well, you might deal with this and this and this because these are the thrust of the, the question. Mm -hmm. So in that way, you know, I would use that type of situation for, for anything. That, that uh, how much you know, should I be doing construction documents for three years? And you might say, no, you should get into some client contact. Or, I, I just don't think that, that the actual structure is necessary. Unless, unless you really don't know. How do you know how much of it you've done if you don't keep track of it? How do you know that you've had it? I mean, when, when do you know when to stop construction documents and start something else? Or when you've had enough programming? It's one of those things where, you know, in three years, you have to encompass an awful lot of knowledge, like she said. So you realize that in three years, you can't be done the same thing for those three years. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think it's an intuitive thing that you're going to have to realize. And, and if, you, if you're a little... Uh, if you're not really sure, then you need to ask people, you know. Mm -hmm. You've been working here at such and such, you got registered, you know, did you do this for this long, or is it necessary to do this for this long? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that, you know, you need to keep checking off things. I mean, I keep my time sheets and all that stuff just for record, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't keep track of exactly uh, what I'm doing. In my head, I know I'm deficient in certain areas, so I'll remember that, but it's not one of those things where I need to have a little piece of paper, you know, things to do today. Well, I don't think IDP is like that either. I mean, it just keeps track. Uh, it's a fairly simple form in the back, and it tells you that you should have so many of this and so many of that, and you try to approach that. Uh, the, the, uh, the state registration boards 
have the responsibility of protection of the health and safety of the people who inhabit the buildings that are designed by architects. In a way, the state registration boards uh, cannot depend solely upon the examination or upon your own understanding of your professional responsibility or of your own decision making as to what kind of experience you feel that you need. And so for that reason, the state registration boards uh, are interested in the quality of that internship period. And so that is one reason that nationally the registration boards have come together to pose uh, an IDP program is to, is to make a higher level of quality to that internship process. It's not saying that you're less a professional or that you don't really know what's good for you, but it is their way of saying that they are, they can assure as best they can that you do have that experience for which they license you. But what I'm thinking is why do you need someone else to tell you what you need to do? Why can't you say, I'm not getting enough experience in this certain area, I'm going to be asked to be transferred into a certain area, or I'm going to go to a different office where I will get where I need. I, you know, I'm, all I'm saying is that she said that you, know, you don't get your, your hand held when you get out of, out of school, and this is actually what I think that's what's doing. I don't think it's holding your hand. It's a piece of paper. It's not doing anything for you. That's right, but why can't I it's, make it? It's showing you the information. Just like when you walk into college, you, you're given an itinerary of what you're going to be learning. You may learn more and less in different areas. Chris, would you use the mic? I think I talk I'll pass it on <laughs> to Mr. Meyer here. Me? Yeah. Well, the, this dissertation that you in the back may have missed up here is a debate on do we really have to have this uh, record and, and this little piece of paper that tells us what we need to work on tomorrow? Um, uh, back to the basic question, I, I do think it's a restraint to registration. Uh, properly used, it can be a value to you uh, in evaluating yourself and giving you more confidence that you have actually uh, worked in all of the various areas that, that might be presented to you. Um, is it a restraint to the protection of the health and safety of the no. public? Or is it an opportunity for the public to have a better quality of health and safety? Well, the whole reason for having it is supposedly to increase the ability of the architect to protect the health and safety of, of the public, right? I, I, I can't deny that. I, I still debate whether it's absolutely necessary. The other point I'd like to make is that, that whether you agree with it or not, or whether I agree with it or not, at this point in time, it would behoove each of you to start your own program. Because our state registration board does not have the final authority as to whether or not this will be mandatory. The group that has the final authority is our state legislature. And if the, a change in the registration law uh, comes up, this could very well be a part of the change that the, registra uh, the, that the legislature makes in the law. And once that law is made, the registration board then has to follow that law. So I would say that anybody that is a junior or above, it would behoove you to start this program right now, even if you do it on your own. Now, I have a whole set of file cabinets full of records that I have kept of things I've done in my practice, jobs I've gone to, meetings I've gone to, uh, for the same reason. I may need them someday. And you may need this someday, and I would say go ahead and start it, whether you think it's a good idea or whether I think it's a good idea or not. There's a question Okay, I just want to follow up on 
what Henry is saying, so that if there's a tone of alarm here, uh, maybe to relieve that, there is not right now any legislation pending that will change the structure of requirements for registration in Indiana. What the Indiana Society of Architects is doing is running a test program. We would like to see that for about four years so we can evaluate it and so that decisions can be properly made. We would hope that legislation would not happen within even that period of time until we can properly evaluate it. However, again, it is a voluntary up to yourselves to participate as you will. I may also add that in the test program that um, IDP has also um, waived the registration fees for those students that want to enter in the test program. That's still correct, I assume, right? So, um, and what you would want to do is if you're a student and you're interested and you, you're into internship, you're getting ready to graduate, you need to contact National or you need to work through, through Ray or if you know you're going to an area within uh, the state, then what you need to do is work through the local component chapters because that's the way it's going to be organized and looked through. Now, if, if the positions are filled in the test program, which we plan to have filled before the end of fall and have it enacted, it is still up to you to go ahead and if, make your decision if you want to become involved in the program or not. We have uh, quite two questions over here. Um, I'd like to stand. Right. You said that our current uh, education here isn't or wasn't sufficient enough. You thought uh, when we were going out working, do you see the IDP as making up what we're missing? And if that is it, should everything that that IDP covers should that maybe just be included in our education add another year onto our already five-year program here? And if something like that's happening, how is our education compared to all of yours that you've already experienced? You're saying that ours is insufficient. How was yours insufficient too? Well, I uh, may have been a little misunderstood in that uh, I don't know that I'm saying that your education is insufficient. I'm saying that it's unfortunate that we won't accept your education and the, the examination process as being adequate today. In other words, I think that, that yeah, we, we may beef up your, your curriculum some, but I would like to beef up the examination to where it's a comprehensive examination that, that tests you on all of the, the things about architecture. And if you pass that exam, uh, you're, you're minimally re, uh, qualified. We have another question? Now, you know, a good point here is, is uh, let me ask you a question. How many years experience would you expect an architect to have before you would give him the commission to design this building? Answer that question. <laughs> Anybody less than there 10? No, Anybody no less than 10? <laughs> Anybody less than 10 years experience before you'd give an architect the commission to do this building? Less than 10, less than, well, nobody less than 10? How many years do you have? One year? Four. Four. He had four years experience. When he, the, the original designer of this building had four years experience working for somebody else when he was given the commission to design this building right here. I would, well, I probably, yeah, I'd, I'd have been very hesitant myself uh, when I only had one year experience. On the other hand, there's always a way to do it. If you only got one year experience and you think you need five, maybe you can find somebody with nine so that you can average out at five, see? You know, there's always a way to get the job done. Get the commission and then we'll worry about getting it done. Question. I said earlier about uh, the IDP seems to help weaker students in, or in the, the real go-getters are going to get the experience they need to get. So my question is, if IDP isn't mandatory, then how is it actually going to help those that aren't real go-getters, other than just letting them know we're missing out on something? 
Well, let's let's go back to let's go back to this first year project. Why wouldn't I take that project at the end of my first year? Probably because I did not have enough confidence in my overall ability to really do this project right. Now, if I've been through IDP and I have checked off all these 14 items, I should feel better about myself than I did if I had not gone through the 14 items. So it's a real confidence builder if you have confidence that you have adequately done each of the 14 items. It should build your confidence immensely. But, uh, we had a question from Bob Madden, but I don't, where, where is he? Now, uh, uh, <laughs> Professor Palmer.
manufacturers, whatever. Having lived in Washington for most of my professional life, I'm always suspicious of things that come out of Washington. And the chance that there is a move to create yet another bureaucracy. to get you a copy uh, of the study. Uh, do you have a copy here? No, I said I participated. You participated in the study. These architects are doing both schematic design and design. Well, I, I, I did schematic design. Uh, I know a lot of architects who did. And yes, you're absolutely correct in your um, explanation that it is based on the uh, standard AIA contracts, um, uh, which I believe a number of us continue to use. <laughs> in their current editions. through that process. You know, IDP started in the early 70s and uh, it's been refined and we started off with a good deal more areas than 14. We started off with a good deal more value units than 700. And by a trial and error process in three states and uh, the activities of the coordinating committee, uh, uh, these were all modified to the extent now that uh, we have in the working program, which has been underway for about four years in its current requirements. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a little sensitive to your, your concern about uh, the way design is being done. Uh, we're not really talking too much about design. We're talking about practice. We're talking about minimum competent, competency to uh, protect the health, safety, and welfare of uh, those who employ us as our clients. Uh, we're not talking about design methodology in IDP. And we're not really dealing, when we talk about schematic design, with design, we're talking about the way an office runs a project through it. We're talking about administration more than anything. Uh, we're talking about documents, and we're not talking about how a project uh, comes about in the mind of the designer. Certainly not.
back to conventional thinking. That part. Um, I realize that one or two or three voices out there in the nowhere is not going to have that much impact on what's going on in Washington. My only encouragement is that you seriously go back and look at some of those things and see if it is possible. I know it's possible. See if your board will actually, because I think it's a foregone conclusion, we're going to get this thing whether we like it or not. Um, Well, I couldn't be said to be campaigning. I'm, I was invited to explain a program in a state that I understand is considering a trial period. Well, and Well, I, I, you know, I, I must confess I don't precisely understand what things you would change in the 14 areas uh, to make it reflect more of what's going on in practice. I have been in practice, and it seems to me that it reflects the realities of practice. These are classical divisions of a practice. Uh, schematic design has appeared in the contract documents for years. There's a definition of it. And uh, many of us do it. Uh, building cost analysis is something that uh, certainly we could all. Uh... Yeah. Well, let's go back to the issue of programming. Okay. Uh, now, I think programming is far larger and can involve much more than that, again, 30 year old statement. <laughs> Yes, I know that. Uh, in architecture, that becomes an incredibly important issue to the point that it shows up in the NAAB criteria now. And again, the number of firms that are dealing with strictly that issue in organizational planning, for example, and there are a lot of them, that is not in there. It's not, it's not reflected. I'm not saying it should be. What I'm really saying is, can the IDP nomenclature be squeezed down to an absolute minimum, give the intern some flexibility to move around through that, understanding that this idea of architecture is a very broad idea. I think that's exactly what we do. Uh, the, uh, the IDP program has minimums that have to be gained in certain areas, and the balance of the credits can be obtained in uh, any of the areas or in what we call other activities. Uh, uh, just slightly over half of the credits have to be acquired in one, you know, in the specific uh, minimums. Uh, there's no restriction that this is the only thing that can be done. It's, it's a suggestion, it's a guide, it's a standard. It's a minimum. And beyond that, it's what the intern makes of it. I think. People do it. <laughs> Chris? There are 465 units that are required in those specific categories. The rest, up to 700, you can gain in whatever way you wish, as long as you're working under the direction of a registered architect. You can work on interior design. I'm working for a year in the, in the institute, running the student chapters. I'm not doing architecture. I'm doing more management. And I'm gaining a year's worth of related activities. You can do a, a year's master's and gain a year's worth. So it's not that constraining. You can go on to develop areas that you'd rather develop. Yes, do we have a uh, question or comment here? Even the people that are supporting that and the end, people are against it, feel that it shouldn't become mandatory and it should remain an option. I go to school down in Alabama where if you look on your program, it's supposed to be a very active state as far as that's concerned. We just 
had this meeting last week, and people down there feel this as well as people here. It shouldn't be uh, mandatory. It should remain an option. And uh, whether it's a good option or, you know, if people feel negative about it, I think it should be left up to the individual. And that's the bottom line. Did, did you hear that comment? Well, we have a guest here from from uh, uh, school in Alabama, and in Alabama, the uh, they just had a meeting like this a week ago, where the discussion seemed to be quite similar. Where the decision was that indeed it should be an optional thing, not a mandatory thing. So it's nice to have that comment from another state. Yes, sir. Then why would this? That I think uh, this is a question I would like to hear uh, you speak on as uh, uh, Lois as well as, well as Henry because both of you said that you that you thought no, that the question the uh, question uh, sorry the question was should uh, why should it be mandatory or why should why it is not it? Mandatory. Why was it mandatory yeah. in some states? I would ask the same question. Why should it be mandatory or why should it not be, be mandatory? mandatory? There are 14 states that require IDP as a precursor to taking the architect registration exam. For the most part, those are states that adopted it as a requirement because it was the simplest thing for them to do. The requirements for admission to the uh, registration exam are set by the individual states. In a state with a small board with no particular professional competency in professional staff, for instance, if they don't have an architect who is, uh, say, the executive director of the board or something like that, it is far easier for them to simply adopt a standard and say anybody who complies uh, then can be admitted to the exam. In other words, they will require that the NCARB council record be maintained and when NCARB sends them the completed council record they'll admit you to the exam and all they have to do is put your name on a list from another list. Uh, and that's the attraction to the state registration boards for a mandatory IDP. It's very simple. It's much more complicated and time consuming for a state to do what Indiana does now, look over your requirements uh, or your, your qualifications individually when your record comes in as you're getting re ready to take the exam. Or look over an IDP record that you've maintained when you've completed it and send it in. Have, have those mandatory states had legal problems with the requirements? There have been some, yes. And I think that probably uh, the major issue that's going to arise, uh, or actually has, has started, is uh, the, um, uh, the matter of admission to practice you know, from a non-IDP state. Uh, that's going to be a, a continuing concern, I think, of the next few years. Two states, um, uh, Florida and uh, Louisiana, and actually now, uh, now Texas have their own state systems where they use the IDP system, but they manage the program at the state level. And, and they don't require the IDP state record, but they do all of the reviewing of the records themselves within the state on the state registration board. Um, and uh, two states, Louisiana and Texas, have a paid IDP coordinator that takes charge of doing that. But the major reason why you will see it as being mandatory in some states is uh, simply the opinion that it will be much easier to manage and it will require less staffing. These days, when government agencies are being asked to cut their budgets by X percent, uh, there very often is no one who will stand up against it and say that, you know, uh, that we have to maintain these things in the state, that it's important. Uh, to keep control of the process ourselves, it's much easier just to get the notice from NCARB and, uh, and admit you to the exam. And somebody else essentially has done the work and you've paid for it. So actually, the ball has started rolling and the government has really taken it a little too far? It's not the government. Um, the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards is, uh, uh, and, and the state is a, an organization uh, of the local registration boards, but strictly speaking, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a quasi governmental, they are quasi governmental agencies. Uh, uh, and it, uh, it's interesting because the AIA has always opposed mandatory implementation of IDP in a state. And most of the state registration board members who usually serve uh, voluntarily for a, a term 
our AIA members. Even so, the attraction of having that easily administered program is, uh, is often more than they can uh, uh, resist. Would Henry Meyer like Henry, to do you want to talk about Henry, Henry yes. are you a member of the state register? Pardon? No, I'm anti. <laughs> I've got a little discussion going with the registration board myself. Um, let's see, we were going to talk about. Uh, oh, should it be mandatory? Or? Uh, I was answering his question about uh, about um, why do states have it? Why do states have it mandatory? Let's go back a little further than what Lois went and and go back to uh, why we even have a three-year experience requirement. Uh, the three-year experience requirement came back in the 60s uh, in response to uh, the great uh, consumer advocates who in those days were pursuing everything being better and everything being better cataloged and uh, better controlled. And in that our Indiana State Registration Board was up for sunset review, uh, our registration board felt that in our State Society of Architects, both, felt that we needed to do something to show those people that we're really getting better and we're doing a better job of controlling ourselves because we do control ourselves as a profession in that uh, at that point in time all of the board members were our registered architects and these registered architects were controlling architects and that was bad you know you're not supposed to do that so they threw in the three-year obligation and, and Indiana was one of the first states to do this and most other states then followed because NCAR picked that up as a good idea and, and suggested that everybody do it. And so most of them jumped in line and did it. Okay, now we've got a three-year requirement for all of the non-registered people. What are we going to do with them? So now we need a method of, of monitoring what they're actually doing because we can't just have them out there drawing window details and, and uh, bathrooms. We used to draw window details. I guess it's bathrooms now. But in any case, uh, we, had to com we had to know what they were doing, so a an AIA committee was appointed to study that, and they came up with uh, a very crude IDP about 10 years ago, as Lois has talked about, uh, a program which required almost every hour of your three years to be cataloged, almost every hour, the first program that came. And that's when I was really opposed to this. You know, I I've toned down quite a bit in eight or nine years here because they have responded to many of my complaints, the ones that I was hearing too. You know, like she said, it's only 56, there's, it's 5,600 hours that you have to account for specifically in, within three years to meet the, the, the basic requirements here. So, so to go way back, that's where it came from. Then, like I said, they had a, the whole year you had to account for, and then that got a lot of static and so it was geared down to this 14 items, which uh, cor sort of correspond with the AI uh, contracts and other documents that we have. So uh, at this point in time, it, it's a relatively manageable program compared to what it was. Hey, it's, it's just about time for us to, to uh, take another, another break. We'll take one more. Uh, question here, and then we will uh, reassemble in. Well, we're not sure. There might be some professional show up, so we might have another quick presentation that they'll try it out. I think there's going to be anybody else show up. In that, in that case, all of the panel will be available uh, to you uh, around the coffee pot and the, and the Pepsi machine and the exhibits uh, area. So we'll have one last question. Yes, sir. Please stand. It would seem to me, from everything that's been said this afternoon, that we as students have no choice but to follow the IDP when we get out and start our internship for the main reason that if our professional practice would take us somewhere else to another state that requires a mandatory IDP, that if our professional practice takes us there, that we will have to have it to get there and also living in the fear that they will change, that Indiana will change to a mandatory IDP before we get done with our internship. Is that right or is that wrong? Who would like? Lois? 
Lois? Anybody that's in the pipeline, you know, for ID, no IDP or mandatory IDP, that doesn't probably, unless Indiana surprises me very much, have anything to worry about. IDP is a good idea, and you should resist thinking of it as something that's going to require you to do something other than either you want to do, or then it will be easy to do, or uh, practicable to do. Um, it, it, it's not something that you're going to have too much difficulty. It's more a direction than, than a requirement. Um, you won't have, I'm sure, any trouble in Indiana when you enter your internship period. If IDP hasn't adopted, been adopted uh, as either mandatory or voluntary, you just finish the requirements that were current when you graduated. Uh, and right now, you won't have any problem uh, in practicing in another state that requires IDP uh, if you haven't got an IDP background. Ten years down the road, if you were still a student, that might be different. Your state might require it. There may be some, um, you know, it, it may be established nationwide to the point that it becomes a standard for the profession. But I think that you need not fear that that's going to happen to you individually, uh, you know, that you're going to be forced to do something that you, that you don't uh, wish to do. Uh, you know, our, our whole point uh, in the AIA and the mandatory voluntary thing is that people come to architecture in a lot of different ways, and we would like to make it possible for as many different people to get there by as many different routes as, uh, as possible. And IDP will be helpful to an awful lot of people. Some people it's not going to sit well with, and for some people it may not be possible to even do it. Uh, although we've had interns, uh, you know, in remote areas in New Mexico, complete IDP. Um, we'd like to maintain that variety in the profession, but I encourage you all to take a look at IDP and see if you don't think it'll make it a little bit easier to get to first the exam and second to professional practice. Thank you, thank you very much, Lois. I'd like to uh, express thanks uh, of the college and the department to the panelists and especially to uh, Lois and Chris for coming out here and traveling this way to be with us today and for uh, that devil of an advocate Henry Meyer for being here and for Ron and Tim and Ray Kirkhoff for, for joining us. Many, many thanks. Appreciate it.